Amen. All right. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 30 is a very important chapter. We're, we're dealing with the subject of charity. It's what the entire chapter is dedicated to, is this concept of charity. Now, keep a place, a bookmarker here. We're going to be turning to a few other scriptures. We're turn, starting off to Colossians 3. And the reason, what we're going to be doing is we're looking at multiple places where charity is mentioned in the New Testament because I want to just emphasize the importance of, the, of what we're learning tonight with charity because the Bible talks about charity. It's, it's, a, it's a very important uh, aspect or characteristic that we need to have in our lives. So we're going to look at it. We're going to understand what it's talking about. A lot of people have misconceptions of what charity even means and what it is and also how important it is. So if you turn real quick to Colossians chapter 3, it's the first place we'll look. And we'll come back and, and go through the rest of this chapter after we turn to a few pages here, a few, few places, excuse me. So as you go right, you got Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. And verse number 12, the Bible reads, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. And you'll notice as we read these how many of the same attributes we're going to find in, this, in 1 Corinthians 13 that we're seeing listed off here. The long-suffering, the, the, hum, the humility. Uh, verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Look at verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. All these things that we just read here in verses 12, 13, and 14, these are all important things, wouldn't you say? I mean, being forgiving, being humble, being long-suffering, being meek, bowels of mercy, kindness. He says, above all of these things, put on charity. It's a pretty important. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Just keep going a little bit to the right in your Bible, just a few pages. Um, you've got real short books here, 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse number 5 reads, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. So the end of the commandment, well, the commandments is, is following God's law, right? The end of that, the result of that, the, 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 the whole point of that is to have charity out of a pure heart, right? If you want to keep on going to the right in your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, you get past... Hebrews and James, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 reads, And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Again, I mean, you notice these commandments. The end of the commandment is charity. Above all these things put on charity. Above all things have fervent charity. Charity, and then uh, Second Peter chapter one, just about one page over, probably in your Bible. Second Peter chapter one, verse five says, "And beside this, give all diligence, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity." For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I just preached a, a whole sermon on this passage here uh, called uh, Blind Christians. And um, notice, though, it gives uh, this whole list, you know, adding to your faith. And we went through all these different things that you, that you kind of add and build one upon the other in your Christian life. You just add to that and add to that and add to that. And notice the very last thing that you're adding is charity. It's the end of the commandments, above all these things. Charity is extremely important, so let's see if we can understand what this is even talking about. Let's go back to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And we're going to do one verse out of order here. We're going to look at the last verse of 1 Corinthians 13 because it ties in with everything else that we just turned to. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13 says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. All of that just to emphasize what we're learning tonight and how serious we should be taking this, this teaching and this doctrine in 1 Corinthians 13. It's important. I mean, we've seen over and over again how what God, the importance that God places on charity. This is a really big aspect. It ought to be something that we're striving for in our life to be more charitable, to have more charity. Now, 
the chapter starts off here, and we're going to go through all the verses, by mentioning a few spiritual gifts that a person may have and how they basically mean absolutely nothing if you don't have charity. We went over in, in chapter 12 a little bit about the spiritual gifts, and we're going to continue on in chapter 14 about speaking with other tongues. But in verse 13, he's saying, look, it doesn't matter if you have all these great gifts from God, if you don't have charity... It means nothing. So let's start looking at this chapter and see if we could, we could figure out what charity is really talking about. Because most people have a concept today, when you hear the word charity, you think of giving money to an organization, right? I mean, it's charity. That, that's what most people think is charity. And that is not charity. Now, you can have charity in doing that act, but that act alone is not charity. And we're going to see that. The Bible actually specifically says that that's not the case. That you could, have, you could do that and not be charitable at all and have no charity in your heart. And people do it all the time. But if you remember in the last chapter that God has given us our gifts, the spiritual gifts, to profit with all. The Bible says in order for us to profit, in order to do service unto God and, and, and to, and to uh, have fruit and to abound. Let's look at verse number 1 right here in 1 Corinthians 13. Bible reads, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So what's he saying here? He's like, I could speak with the tongues of men. If I'm, if I'm able to speak all the tongues of men, all the different languages, and be able to preach the gospel with all these different people, and even angels, but I don't have charity, I'm just like, just sounding brass, just like an instrument playing or something. It's just, it's, it's, it doesn't mean anything. Just a tinkling cymbal. He's saying it's just a noise. It's just, it's, it's basically nothing. Verse number two, along the same token, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries, right? This is, and, and these are more things that people strive for, right? People strive to be able to understand Bible prophecy, to understand the mysteries, the deep things of God. I can have all this understanding of the Bible. I could be this great scholar and just completely understand what God is talking about here. And, have, and it says, and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains. I mean, think about that power. You know, Jesus Christ talked to his disciples. He says, you know, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you say unto this mountain, be removed, you know, and, and it's going to listen to you. He said, you could have the faith to be able to just move mountains. Great faith. I mean, increased faith. Increased knowledge. He says, and have not charity. If I have these things and I don't have charity, I am nothing. And people think about, man, I just want to be so learned, have so much knowledge of the Bible. If you don't have charity, it's going to mean nothing. And even all that faith, I mean, think about that. That's an amazing amount of faith. You're going to be able to move mountains. He says it's nothing. You need to have charity. The whole point is having charity. Verse number three, and this proves my point about charity not just being, giving money to people. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, right? That's the common definition that you think of of charity, right? Giving money to feed the poor, to, to help out people in need. And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So is it possible to give money unto people? He says, all of my goods. You can give up everything you have and still not have charity. So how is that even possible? Well, think about these people. I think about like the, the, the people who like to sound a trumpet before they give their alms. You know, Jesus warned about these people that, you know, he says, let not your left hand know what your right hand doeth. And, you know, you give in secret and your father which seeth in secret will reward thee openly. That's what Jesus taught. About, about helping people out and giving alms to the poor. Well, what do we have today? We have these big corporations and organizations. You know, you have the Bill Gates Foundation. And you have these other people. And what do they like to do? Hold a big press conference, right? And let, that, let the whole world know how much money they're giving to these organizations. Now, if you think that those people really care about those people that they're, that they're giving money for, you've been deceived. 
because they don't. They don't care about that stuff at all. They're doing it for the, the, the PR, right? They're doing it for the publicity. They're doing it because they want people to look at them and think, wow, what a great person. They care about the praise of men more than the praise of God, which is why they sound a trumpet before they, they give their, you know, if they really cared about the people, they would say, I don't need the recognition for this. I'm just going to give money to these people. I'm going to help this organization. I'm going to help these people out without having to let everybody know about it, right? If they really cared about them. Now, charity, we're going to get into here. You know, if charity is not all of these things, well, what is charity? And the Bible describes what charity is. Here, we'll start going through this. Verse number four, it just basically gives a whole list of all these attributes of having charity. And basically, charity is, it's, a, it's caring for other people. It's a love in your heart for others. It's a special type of love towards other people. That's what charity is. The Bible says in verse 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. So let's look at the, the first thing there. It says suffereth long. Charity suffereth long. It means you're able to put up with a lot. Charity is able to, if you have that love, that charity for other people, you're able to put up with a lot of things. You're able to suffer a lot of things that might be coming your way. So if you're a person that has charity, what's your goal? Your goal is caring about other people. Your help, you want to help other people. Maybe help get someone else saved. Help to preach the gospel of Christ to the lost. Well, if you have charity in your heart and in your life, you'll be able to put up with you know, people mocking you and calling you names. Even the person that you're witnessing to, to be able to love them enough, even if, if they're saying it to your face, to be able to, to suffer that in order to still love them and, and try to give them the gospel. Which is exactly, you know, in every single attribute, there's, there has not been a human being on this earth that has epitomized a charitable life other than Jesus Christ, right? He is, he is the the pinnacle of being charitable, of having this love for other people, when you look at all the things that he suffered and he endured, why? Because he loved us. He loved the lost. He loved sinners. And he wants us to be saved. So he endured the death of the cross. He endured these things. He had a charitable attitude, a charitable heart. It says, suffereth long and is kind. Right? Being kind, that's the real sin. We don't have to go real in depth on that. You just don't be a jerk, right? <laughs> You're not having a jerk type of an attitude. You be kind to people. You know how to treat people and, and not just, you know, there's a lot of people that like to, uh, and here's, here's something that separates us and what we do. You know, we have a very big uh, evangelistic type of approach with this church. It's, it's a lifeblood of our church. We go out, we preach the gospel, we talk to people. But what we don't do, we don't stand on the corner and just rail on people and just tell them how wicked they are and that they're going to hell. There's churches that do that and they say, you know, like, turn or burn and, and just telling everybody to, uh, just how wicked all of them are. I don't think that's effective. I don't see that in the Bible. Now, it is important for people to understand that they're a sinner and there's a consequence for their sin. And I don't hold back from that. But there are ways of approaching people. You can do things in kindness. You can, you can explain to someone that, hey, look, you know, we're all sinners. You know you've sinned before. You know, you know, show them the punishment that God has for their sin. But then also then bring them the love. Bring them, bring them the good news. Amen. You know, we're not just going to stand out in the corner and just give everyone the bad news and, just, and that's it. Like, you're sinners. Okay. Why don't we bring them the good news? Right? This is, this is exactly what we do. And, and that's the way you be charitable. You suffer long. You're kind. The Bible says, charity envieth not. So envieth not. You're not focused on the things that other people have and just want them. You, you, know, you can't have a, 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 a deep care and concern for other people when you have the selfish view of being envious of looking at what they have and wanting it for yourself. Because that's what envy is. You, you want something other people have. It could be physical things. It could be a house. It could be you know, a boat. It could be a car. It could be their family. It could be, you know, children. It could be, oh, man, they, you know, I want that type of marriage. You know, that man has a nice wife. I wish I was married to a wife like his. And, just, you know, and like really just envying other people's stuff. That's wickedness and that's sin. And that's being very selfish. And that is, that is the opposite of having charity. Because a charity would be concerned about other people instead of concerned about what you don't have and thinking about yourself and being that selfish attitude. 
envieth not, not envious of anything that other people have. The Bible says charity vaunteth not itself is not lift up. So that word vaunteth, it's kind of old, but basically it's the same thing as being puffed up. It's having pride. You think of the, the that word vaunt is similar to the word vault. You know, and you, uh, in gymnastics they have the, the vault and you run and you jump and you, know, you, you, you are lifted up over the, the horse or whatever. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. In order to, to have charity, you need to be humble. You don't lift yourself up and think you're better than everybody else. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, you don't have to turn, you can just listen. Uh, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. This is the way, you know, the, the, the Holy Spirit that we have, we want to keep that unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace by being lowly and meek in mind, being able to be humble. And again, humility is, there, you know, we live in a world that tells you that you need to have, you know, this, this self-esteem. And I don't like that word self-esteem. Now, being confident is one thing, and I'm all for being confident. Knowing that you're a child of God and that you are a special person because, you know, God has saved you and God has a job for you and, and, and you're a child of God. You, you know, the Bible says that, that we're priests and, and, um, and we're going to be kings, ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ. These are all very important things. God has, has committed unto us the ministry of reconciliation. We're ambassadors for Christ. Very important thing. So not saying that you have no worth or no value, but the reason why I don't like self-esteem because we're not supposed to be esteeming ourselves better than other people. You can hold, you could say that, hey, I'm a person. I have a, a great value in God's sight and that would be true. Amen. Praise the Lord. We ought to have that mind. But the way that we ought to live is saying, yes, I have a high value, but other people have a higher value than me. That's the way that we need to approach people is that you're more important than I am. That's what ministry is. That's what serving is. That's what doing unto others is, 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 is doing for them. That's the attitude that Christ had. Christ came not to be ministered unto, but to, be, to, but to minister. He came to help other people. He didn't come as the king and just, just everyone worship me. He came and gave us the example and said, look, I'm the king of kings and lord of lords and look what I'm doing. He got down on his hands and his knees and washed his disciples' feet. Talk about humility. That's humbleness. And my friends, if anybody didn't have to do something like that because they were above that and greater than it, it's our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So how much more you can you think, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go try to help that guy over there. He's homeless and he stinks. And have that type of an attitude where I'm above that. We ought not to have that type of an attitude. We need to be charitable and not lift ourselves up. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8, we went over this when we went over chapter 8, but verse number 1 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And we saw earlier in this chapter, having all knowledge, right? You could have all knowledge of the Bible. And people do this. People study their Bibles, they may go to church, and they study, and they study, and they get all these books, and they read, and they read, and they never do anything for anybody else. And these are usually the most proud people you're going to run into, and they'll tell you all day wrong, why you're wrong about this, and you're wrong about that, and I'm so smart, and I know everything, and they're not doing anything for Christ. They're not doing anything to help other people. We need to be balanced. Is it important to have knowledge? Yes. Yes. Should we bring our Bible? Of course we should. We should be studying His Word. But you can't just do that. We have to have this charity because if you don't have charity, that knowledge means nothing. And the charity is the caring for other people enough to bring them the truth, to witness to them, to show them the love of God, and to help them where they need help. That's what charity is. But see, knowledge, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, knowledge puffeth up. It gives you, it, it could get you to that point where you start thinking, wow, I'm smarter than everyone else and I know so much more. And you start thinking so highly of yourself. That's why you need that charity. Because the charity edify, what does edify mean? It means you're building someone else up. 
That's what it means. Edifieth means you know an edifice on a on a building. It's 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 a it's a part of a building. When you edify someone else, you're edifying them. You are building them up. You're helping to raise them up. And that's the whole point of, of reaching other people is, is, to, is to have that charity to, to, to help them out. Now, the more knowledge you have, I think, the more effective you will be at being able to edify other people. The more you know the scripture, the more you'll be able to share with other people and say, hey, the Bible says this, the Bible says that, and to give more wisdom and to, and to, and to give that unto other people to help them. But the point is to help them, not just to tell them how wrong they are and tell them how bad they are, right? I mean, there are ways of doing it. And sometimes, honestly, people need to be told that they're wrong. They need, to, they need a rebuking, maybe. But there are ways of doing that to where the whole point is still to help them. Even in, in uh, the, the instances where you need to break fellowship with somebody, as the Bible dictates, if someone's a drunkard or a railer or an extortioner, you know, gives off all these things that he says, you know what, with such and one, no not to eat. Don't even go out to eat with that person. Why? They need to be you know, shunned, if you will, in a, in a sense, to, to understand it's for their own good. That's why the Bible says, you know, I delivered such a one unto Satan that they, you know, um, that the, 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 the flesh may be destroyed, but the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So it's still for their benefit. Some people just have to learn the hard way. And you can't just be enabling people and continuing along. You know, if someone's a drunkard, they're not just going to be, you know, we're not just going to let the drunkard come to church every single week and just pretend like nothing's wrong. No, they got a serious problem. And sometimes people just need to be separated and say, you know what? I can't even go out to have lunch with you. You really have to fix this problem. And, and it doesn't always sink in until people get that, wow, this is a big deal, but it's for their benefit. Right? And those are more extreme situations anyways where you have to deal with someone like that. But it's still the, the edifying and, and having charity and, and having the love to even make that type of a stand. It's not loving to just pretend like everything's fine. It's not loving to just pretend that, that if you know somebody just believes in work salvation, just to let them keep thinking that they're going to heaven and not to say you're not. Not to say, look, you, you know, you're not believing, right? You, you know, the Bible says that it's, you know, by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. And, and to be able to show them that. Now, it may make a, a situation uncomfortable. It might even make somebody mad at you. But if you truly love them, you're going to tell them that. You have to. Because the alternative means you're okay with them just going to hell. At what cost? At the cost of someone maybe being offended at you? We ought to have more love than that. Let's keep uh, continuing on here. These verses we left off in verse number four with, you know, charity doesn't, doesn't get lifted up in pride, doesn't vaunt itself, is not puffed up. Verse number five, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. So some more attributes of being charitable. Behaving unseemly meaning inappropriately, right? Unseemly, doing things that you, you ought not to be doing. It's, it's unbecoming, right? If you have charity, your behavior is going to be appropriate. You're not going to be saying inappropriate things. You're not going to be talking to someone else's spouse in an inappropriate manner. You're not going to be doing these things. Why? Because you have charity. If you don't have charity, it's the opposite. You're going to be behaving unseemly. Uh, seeketh not her own. Again, this ties in with being lowliness and meek of, meekness of mind, esteeming other people better than yourself. That's what it says in Philippians that, uh, that um, we need to esteem other better than yourself, uh, even as the Lord Jesus Christ did you. He gave us that example. Um, so you don't, you're not worried about your own stuff. You're worried about those things. About, just like John, John, even John the Baptist you know, he had this great ministry and he had a lot of people following him and he was baptizing people and it was this great ministry. He was changing lives and preaching hard and doing, you know, this, this great thing out in the wilderness. But what was he doing? He was pointing people to Christ. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. He's saying, this, is, this isn't about me. Now it tells me John probably could have had just a great following of people following him if, if that's what he really wanted. But he didn't. Because that wasn't his job in the first place. And he had the charity to say, you know, and the humility to say, it's not about me. I'm not seeking my own, you know, vanity or my own followers. I just want people to follow Christ. And that's why he said, behold, the Lamb of God. And he was saying, you know, go follow him. 
There's Jesus right there. Like, he's the one that I've been preaching about and talking about. Go, follow him. I want his ministry to do better and to increase. Babe, mine's going to decrease because it's all about Christ. And that's the attitude that we need to have. That's the attitude that charity has, where we could just give up on our self and our own glory and do things for, for other people and for the glory of Christ. Seeketh not our own. Is not easily provoked. And again, there's that word, you know, uh, it ties in with what we've read earlier of suffering long. Being able to suffer things when you're not easily provoked. When people aren't just able to, to just push your buttons, man, and get you angry and get you hot. And, and, you know, basically being slow to wrath. You know, we, we read that last week, uh, being uh, quick to hear, slow to anger, slow to wrath. Now, it doesn't mean that, that being angry or, or wrathful even is just always wrong, but you ought to be very slow to it. Jesus Christ did get angry, and it wasn't a sin, when he, when he saw the, the money changers and the people in the temple, and he flipped over their tables, and he made a whip, and he drove them out of the temple. He was angry. He had a righteous anger, but he didn't lose. He didn't. He didn't. He wasn't not in control. He was able to to have the control to make himself a scourge. The Bible says he made the whip and then drove him out with it. So he didn't just fly off the handle in a rage, just uncontrollable, and and went off on people. He knew exactly what he was doing, but and he was slow to wrath. It takes a while to, to, to get him to that point, but he did get there. You know, I'm just, just explaining that we, we ought to not be easily provoked. It doesn't mean you, know, you could never be provoked, but it shouldn't come very easily. And one of the reasons why, we, we need to be able to suffer long. We need to be able to not be easily provoked. Why? Because the world doesn't like this message, and they're going to do things and say things to push your buttons. If you ever try to do work for God by reaching people with the gospel, it happens. Right? Even today, I mean, it's a very, very minor thing. It's a real small. It's almost a silly example. But the, the, these people saw us walking down the streets and we were talking to a guy, giving him the gospel, and his people stopped by and were like, um, you know, is that your car? Like, oh, I was going to have your car towed. And they were kind of joking around. Like, it wasn't a big deal. But things like that, it's going to be, you know, you can't be easily provoked when people say things. And, and that's, that's not the best example because they were kind of joking. But, you know, and, and like I said, it's not a big deal. But, People will do more and more. People will, will say things and do things to provoke you. People will, will call you names and, and, and just say all kinds of manner of blasphemous things. And we, we ought not to be easily provoked to just to fly off the handle or to lose our control or something like that. And then the Bible says, thinketh no evil. Now, evil in the Bible, and, and I'll have to preach a sermon about this just completely proving it, but evil is when you do harm to somebody else. It's when you inflict pain. You know, the Bible says that God does evil. Evil doesn't always equate to sin. Evil, God does evil? Yes, in the Old Testament. That's why I'm going to have to do a whole sermon on it to, to prove the point. But the Bible, says, yeah, the Bible says, is there evil in the city and the Lord hath not done it? And Evil does not always equate to sin. Here's what evil means. Evil means when you bring harm to someone else. So a real good example of this where it's not a sin would be if somebody commits a sin that is worthy of the death penalty. Someone takes another man's life. The Bible says that that person ought to, ought to die. That's the, the, the just punishment or recompense for, what, for that sin, for, for killing someone else. They need to be killed. Well, someone has to put that person to death. There has to be an executioner. So the person who performs the execution, however you do that, whether you flip a switch on an electric chair, whether you shoot a gun, a fire, whatever it is, inject a needle into them, it doesn't matter. That person is bringing evil upon the other person because they're harming them. I mean, they're, they're going to be taking their life. That is bringing evil into them, but it's not sinful to be, to have that job of the executioner when you're executing righteous judgment that has been ordained by God. If that makes sense. So that's what, and, and, you know, that requires a whole Bible study of the word evil itself in the Bible to see how it's used over and over again. And um, it doesn't always necessarily mean sin. But see, in this case, if you're thinking evil against someone, you're thinking about harming them, that is a sin, right? Most times, evil is going to be sinful because you're not supposed to be hurting and harming other people. So, um, but here, if we have charity, obviously, if you're caring about other people, you're not going to be thinking evil against them. 
And this is written here just to admonish us that we shouldn't be having evil thoughts against other people and just wishing people harm and, you know, and, 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 and thinking that way about other people, especially about brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 6. The Bible says, Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So, rejoice means you're celebrating, you're happy, right? It's, it's something that's joyful. You shouldn't be joyful in iniquity, in sin. When you, you, know, when you get in sin, you know, obviously there's an allure of sin. You know, Satan tries to deceive us and makes sin look attractive. Right? That's, that's why people get into it in the first place. He tries to make it look like it's this great thing, but once you get into it, you, know, you shouldn't be rejoicing in that sin. You should be ashamed of that sin. And um, you, know, you shouldn't be deriving pleasure out of your sin or out of other people's sins. You know, we shouldn't be rejoicing in iniquity when someone else stumbles and, and gets caught up in the sin. You say, oh yeah, I didn't like that guy anyway. It's good for him. Serves him right. You know, having that type of an attitude when, when someone else stumbles and falls and, and rejoicing over that. That type of rejoicing is evil. That type of rejoicing is wrong. We shouldn't be, be you know, rejoicing in the fact of other people getting involved in sin and iniquity. But we should be rejoicing in the truth. Right? The Bible says, And he shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Right? The truth is what frees us from the bondage. That's what's rejoicing about it. It, it. it frees us from the bondage of sin and iniquity. We should be exalting that and being happy about that. When a sinner is converted, praise the Lord. Hey, it's a joyous event. And when you have, when you have charity, you care about other people, you don't want them getting involved in sin. Verse number 7. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Again, this is talking about charity. Charity has all these attributes. Beareth all things. Again, it's basically the same thing, I would say, as being long-suffering. Being able to bear something. Bear means like you're carrying it. right? You're, bearing, you're, you're able to carry a hard load. Nothing is too hard to bear to be able to carry with a charitable heart because you, you, you're, you're, you're enduring things for other people and you're caring for them enough just as Jesus cared enough for us to, to bear the cross and to carry his own cross to, to his grave out of his charity and his love for us. Believeth all things. Every word of God is true. Every word of God is pure. We ought to believe everything in the Bible. We ought not to, to say, well, you know, I believe the Bible, but there's some things in here because it's not politically correct these days. Because people will say, oh, no, you can't say that or else you're hateful. Oh, you can't believe that. Or, you know, no, look. Amen. The Lord said all these things and I believe them. And I'll shout them from the rooftops and I don't care what the world says. I don't care how much it changes or how wicked it gets and how much they hate it. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to believe all things that is in this book that comes from the mouth of our Lord. Believeth all things. Hopeth all things. Romans uh, 4. I've got a, a verse for this in Romans 15. You can turn it if you like. It's just uh, backwards a few pages to, to Romans 15. We have a hope, right? What's hope? Hope is, is, is knowing and believing in something that, that you can't see with your eyes. You're hoping for it. It's not that there's any doubt. Some people today you think of hope and you think that there might be doubt associated with hope. No, there's no doubt. Hope just means that you can't see it. You still believe that it's there, though. It's, it's, it's similar to having faith and hope. Verse uh, 4 of Romans 15 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The things written in the Bible, he's talking about the things that were written aforetime. In this case, the Old Testament, the things that were written before. They're there for our learning, for us to get knowledge, to understand more. That we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. When you know ahead of time, hey, look, all these, all these prophets in the Old Testament, all these people, they went through persecutions and afflictions and they had hard times. It will give you the patience so that when hard times come in your life, when you experience problems, I mean, we look at the, the, the story of Job. What a story of someone who's gone through so much. But you can look at that and we have the, the advantage of being here, of looking back at the Word of God and seeing that story and saying, hey, he made it through just fine. Although right in the moment, in the middle of things, it was probably like, how in the world? I mean, he wanted to die. How could anything get better? 
But we have the scripture for our learning so that we could understand, wow, these people went through way worse than I'll probably ever go through in my lifetime. And they were able to endure. It gives us the patience to be able to not freak out when these things happen and to have more confidence and know and to have the hope of knowing the unseen, of knowing it will get better. God's with me. I'm a child of God. And I may be enduring the worst part of my life right now, but I could get through this. And then endureth all things. At the end of verse 7, uh, back in, in 1 Corinthians 13. Again, being able to endure. Being able to have long suffering, be able to bear all things, and be able to endure all things. To make it through. To have that patience to make it through. The Bible says in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, you don't have to turn there. He says, um, Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Apostle Paul said, I endured all things. I made through it. Why? Not for himself, for other people. He had other people in mind. Why? So that they also may obtain the salvation. I'm willing to uh, uh, endure all those things. And Apostle Paul, you read through the things that he went through, how he was shipwrecked, beaten, stoned, you know, whipped all these times. Everything he endured. Why? For the glory of God and, and because he cared about other people. He cared about getting the gospel of Christ out there and souls being saved, converted, and becoming children of God. That is a charitable attitude. This is what needs to be driving us. We need to have charity. He says, above all things, let's have that charity. We can focus on other people. The Bible says in, uh, in verse 8 here in chapter 13, we're almost done, we're getting through the rest of it right now. Verse 8, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So all these other gifts, right? The gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, the gift of knowledge. He's saying, you know what, these things are going to go away. These things can be temporary. These things can come and go. You can have this gift of prophecy and then it's gone. You can fail, right? Tongues, they could cease. They could stop. Knowledge, you could forget things. You could lose it. It's vanish away. But he says, charity never faileth. If you have charity, that's something that should endure, 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 and never go away. Just, uh, I believe, that, you know, um, Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, talking about Jesus, he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That is a charity that never fails. It never stops. It's forever. The, the, the love that Jesus Christ has, he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And praise the Lord for that love, for that eternal love. The, the, and this is, this is the, the great news. And I love being able to share this news with people. You say, yeah, but what if I go off? What if I kill somebody? What if I do this? What if I get in this sin? What if I become a drunk? What if I turn my back on God? Hey, God's love never fails for you. Once you put your faith in Christ and you're born again, His love never fails. He will never leave you or forsake you. you. Say, but what if I forsake God? He will never leave you or forsake you. He does not turn his back on you. He is faithful to his word. When the, when the Lord Jesus Christ said um, in John chapter 5, verse 24, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. When he said those words, he meant them and he's true and he's faithful to those words. He says, You believe on me, you have present tense everlasting life. Everlasting means forever. If he didn't mean forever, he wouldn't have used a word that means everlasting, that means forever. And shall not come into condemnation. He says, you shall not go to hell. You shall not have that condemnation because you are passed from death unto life. When you're born again, your spirit is born again. As a child of God, you are saved forever. And praise the Lord for that type of love and that charity that never fails. It never ends. It never stops. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far as God separates from our sin. That's infinite. The east from the west, they never meet. He separated us, on the one hand, from our sin, on the other hand, through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That doesn't return again. Good news. Verse number 9. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 9. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. So saying right now, everything has not been fulfilled yet. Christ still needs to come back. You know, there's still going to be the rapture of the saints. There's going to be his, his thousand-year kingdom. We are still, you know, we have the Holy Ghost, but we're still, you know, everything is not um, known. Even today, everything is not known. That's why there's people debating over, you know, end times events and all these other things, and everyone thinks they know what's going to happen. I think I know what's going to happen, but ultimately, we don't really know everything. We, and right now, we know in part. Then there's things, you know, like I, I don't understand everything in the Bible. I know in part. We prophesy in part, right? I, I preach the things that I know. He says, but when that which is perfect is come, Jesus Christ, the perfect one, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So all these things that are just partial, is, you know, we're going to have full knowledge also when, when, when Jesus comes back. And uh, what a day that will be, right? When this flesh, this world that, that clouds our understanding, that, that confuses us, we've got you know, all the lies of the world and the brainwashing and everything else that goes on that can help us to, to, to cause us to not fully understand God's Word. We have this sinful flesh that drives us to, to have a, a misunderstanding of God's Word. When all that stuff is gone and done away, and that which is perfect has come, then we'll, then we'll have that, that full understanding. Verse number 11, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So, you know, when I was young, I was growing up. Of course, I mean, that's what a child does. You think like a child. You know, a child thinks about childish things. They, you know, I've got, I've got little ones, and they think about things that children like. They think about jumping on the trampoline. They think about, you know, going out and playing in the sand and doing all these other things. That's because they're children. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you grow up, you're supposed to be putting away the childish things. You know, everybody that's born again starts off a babe in Christ. Nothing wrong with being a baby. I have one at home. He's great, right? <laughs> but you're supposed to grow. And you're supposed to learn. And the more that we grow and learn in the Bible, and, and, and you know, you're saved long, you're learning more, hey, put away the childish things. You could say, maybe put away that sinful life. You're born again. You're saved. What are you still doing going back to your childish ways of, uh, you know, of your life when you were unsaved. You don't need that stuff anymore. That's a, grow up. Right? Get right. Do what's right. Put, put away those things. We don't need them anymore. Get charity. Care about other people. Stop worrying about yourself. Verse number 12, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and I love this, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And I love that phrase, that statement right there. saying Because right now, we, are, we don't know everything. There's a lot of things that we don't understand. We see through a glass darkly. We can see some things, but it's, it's kind of dark. It's kind of covered. It's kind of clouded. It's not quite as clear as we'd like it to be. But he says, in that day, you know, when, when Christ comes back, he says, then we'll know. Even as also we are known, just as much as, as God knows us, as we are known of Him, which is completely, I mean, He knows us 100% completely, He says, then I'll know, even as also I am known. And, uh, and then, of course, the last verse, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. We need to make sure that we have charity, which is the love. It's not just an action. It's, it's more the motivation and the reasoning and in the, in the, in what's in your heart for your actions. Giving money, I'm not saying don't give money to help people out, right? But the reason ought to be there. The charity ought to be in your heart because you care and you want people to do better. When you give that, then that would be considered charitable. That would be a charitable act. When you're not sounding the trumpet and just care about the praise of men, you're actually doing something to help people. When you're, when you're preaching the gospel, when you're able to suffer and endure things, that's having charity. When you're not just flying off the handle, you're not, you're not just losing your temper. 
right? You're not easily provoked. You're able to, to, to go out and have the focus when you have humility, when you can help other people out and be more concerned about them than about yourself, you have charity. And that, my friends, is not easy to do. But it's the greatest thing to do. It's something that it's, it's the same heart that Christ had. Greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. That's what Jesus did. We ought to be able to work in our own hearts to make sure we could get to that point. So we can say, you know what? I am, I'm willing to give up my life for someone else. There's no greater love than that. Be able to just give up everything you have and everything you know. And, and it's not about me. It's about other people. And if you're interested in, in ministry and being able to help other people, as I believe all of us should be, that's what it's all about. But Jesus Christ said when his disciples were, were questioning, you know, who is going to be the greatest? Remember, James and John, they said, I want, I want one seat on your left hand and the other one on your right hand. We want to be recognized. We want to be right up there with you, Jesus. How can we do that? He says, you know, the, the, the kings of this world, the Gentiles, what they do, they have their rulers and their kings and they exercise authority over the people underneath them. He says, but so shall it not be with you. He says, that's not the way it works in God's kingdom. If you want to be whoever wants to be the greatest is going to be servant of all. He says, if, you want, if you want to achieve a great status in God's eyes, you're going to serve everybody. You're going to, you're going to have the, the, the lowliness of mind and the humility to be a servant and not to just look at having power over people or something like that. It's the exact opposite. It's having charity. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for these great words of wisdom. Lord, help us all to, to maintain a charitable heart and attitude, dear Lord God. Help us to be able to look at other people and, and just think of how can I help these people? What can I do, dear Lord? What do you have for me to do to help others, dear God? And help us to, to be mindful of that and, and to... Um, Make sure that we're humble. Make sure that we're meek. Make sure that we're, that we're able to and willing and ready to serve, dear Lord, and not envying other people, not having evil thoughts, dear Lord, but that we would um, be focused in, in following the example that you laid forth for us, dear God. And we thank you so much for that love. We love you because you first loved us, dear God, and help us to show that love unto others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.